UCLA Next starts now. Hey, I'm Scott McLewitz. I'm Merritt McCoy. And I'm Cheryl Umana, and this is UCLA Next. We'll begin tonight with a sports segment and a visit to Sunset Canyon Rec Center. And we promised these guys we'd have a fitness tip on every show, right? We did show those guys smashing a car. Yes, and I, I guess that counts. My tonight rage. we'll get to the Rec Center. We'll also visit the film and TV archives. There's over 100 years of footage there, which is available to the public. Bob Rosen will go back to Euro Oh, it's a really fabulous restaurant. Westwood features an eclectic mix of rices and spices. All right, all right, Scott. He wants cheese. to get invited to one of those dinners because they're free, so he'll say anything. Lots of cheese. Last week, he tried to sound like an intellectual. Mm. Uh, and now he's trying to sound like Julia Child. <laughs> Actually, I was going for Martha Stewart. As I was saying, Bob Rosen will take a second look at Terminator 2. And our campus explorers, Valerie and Alex, will take us swing dancing. But let's start at Sunset Rec. As opposed to a wreck on Sunset. Which we're going to have. This is Lilith here at the Sunset Canyon Recreation Center. Today we're going to see what's inside and what it has to offer to students and faculty alike. Not a problem. We do have two pools. The first pool is our park pool. It's a 50 meter Olympic sized pool. Um, mainly used um, for lap swimming um, exercise. Um, during the springtime and summer times, we open one of the lanes so students can just kind of hang out and just recreate. They don't have to lap swim and just kind of do that. And then down in the lower lawn, most of our students come down here to relax in the sun. Um, our other pool is our family pool, which is up high. That's more of a, it's a 25 yard pool, and that's mainly just for Recreation, I mean, not as much lap, so I'm just, just relaxing. This is the family pool, and right next to it is the picnic area? Yes, this is our family pool. That's a, it's a shallow pool, the 25-yard pool, and then also our big open uh, grass field picnic area. Um, every now and again, we have concerts and uh, things for students to do, but um, it's basically an open grass space for students to, to recreate, play frisbee, whatever they want to do. Wow, great. So I know it's free for UCLA students and faculty. We can come in and enjoy it any time, no cost. What if we want to bring a guest? Maybe family members? Mm -hmm. Can you if, tell us about what Yeah, you can bring any, as many guests as you want to sponsor. Um, and it's $5 for each additional person you want to bring in for adults and $3 for children. So if you have a niece or nephew, you can bring them on by and uh, they can use all the facilities. Wow, that's great. So where are we now? This is one of our rooms that we um, rent out to faculty, student groups. Um, for whatever they need to do. We also have uh, yoga classes and things like that in here. Um, this is the BA room. We also have another one that's similar to this room, um, which is called our Vista room, that has an actual kitchen attached to it. So students, our, our student groups have the opportunity to rent these um, rooms out for meetings or whatnot. Um, usually if it's a sponsored student group, they get it free once a quarter. Um, after that, they still get a huge discount on the room rental. Wow, great. And others can rent it from outside? Mm -hmm. Well, usually outside vendors have to be sponsored by someone at a UCLA group um, to use it, um, or they have to pay a huge sponsor fee. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we do rent it out to different groups now and again. So now we're at the High Ropes course. Um, what exactly is a High Ropes course? High Ropes course is um, basically a lot of different elements that is utilized to um, bring groups together in a team building or, or leadership workshops. Um, a lot of the Anderson groups use these, um, but any student group that wants to put together like a leadership building or a team building workshop, this is something that they could use to overcome fears and things of that nature. So there's a lot of different elements here that you can see, a lot of ropes and things up in the air that people would walk across and you know wow. work together to accomplish goals. Wow. You learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. um, and finally we're here at the tennis club. Um, can you tell us a little about them? How do we sign up to go ahead and play? 
they have a lot of open recreation hours um, that you can actually call the Wooden Center and sign up for any open time at the Wooden Center. Uh, well, I guess that's the end of the tour. Thank you very much. Thank you. We greatly appreciate it. Um, can you go ahead and tell us your hours so we can make sure and come out here and check it out for ourselves? Yeah, basically. Every day we're open 10 to 8, um, excluding some holiday hours, but basically every day, 10 to 8. Okay, and you're open when school's not in session? Yes, we're always open. We're only closed three days of the year, Christmas, New Year's, and Thanksgiving. So come out and enjoy us any other day. Okay, well, thank you very much. So now you know everything the Sunset Canyon Recreation Center has to offer. From swimming, to tennis, to a picnic area, even a place where you could just lie around and get a nice tan. Thanks for joining me. Till next time, make sure you get up, get out, and explore your UCLA. Every time I go up there, the water polo team has the pool. Go up around lunchtime, it's full of professors. If you want to see your professors in Speedos. Mm -hmm. I think I'd rather see the water polo team. <laughs> How about some uh, rare game show footage from the archive? In 1946, the first television sets became available to American consumers. Since that time, television has changed the landscape of American history and popular culture. As a country, we've witnessed everything from presidential debates and the first man walking on the moon to the Olympic Games and the fall of communism, all from a little box in our living rooms. These moments have been captured for posterity, and it's here at the University of California in Los Angeles where experts from the Film and Television Archive make it their mission to collect, restore, and preserve endangered motion pictures and broadcast programming. We had a chance to catch up with Jim Friedman, manager of the Research and Study Center, to unlock the mystery behind the center's holdings. We always say that the the focus of the collection is classic Hollywood cinema, but in fact there's a wide variety of material. Um, we have 70,000 plus television programs. Great emphasis on um, early television, uh, particularly in Los Angeles, independent television, so programs from the 40s, 50s, um, rare, hard to find programs. Um, in film, we have everything from the late 1800s um, going up into contemporary films. We have um, you know, early independent films, we have early classics like D.W. Griffith, uh, foreign films, and recently, a couple of years ago, recently, uh, we worked out an agreement with the Amundsen to create the Sundance Collection at UCLA, and that brought into the fold contemporary independent cinema. So it really runs the gamut of everywhere from you know, 1890s to 2001. The Archive is the largest university-owned collection of its kind. It owns over 27 million feet of newsreel footage dating back to the early 20th century, 10,000 vintage television commercials, and a treasure trove of independent films in its Sundance collection. Scholars and students of film history from across the country come to UCLA to utilize the materials in the Research and Study Center. It's funny, when I first came here uh, about five, six years ago, I, I had viewed this facility as a, uh, a space where the Archive kind of met the university needs, which um, we're in a large academic environment, students study motion and um, moving image um, material. Uh, and I was really surprised to find that probably 40% of the use was from outside the university, was uh, professional. That includes people working on books, um, but it also a lot of people from the production um, community. What goals does the Archive Research and Study Center have in the coming years? Well, our, our goal is really simple, is to help anyone who's looking for um, material in film and television at, at the Archive Research and Study Center. There's really no area of um, our culture that media doesn't touch. So therefore, there's few areas that media is not relevant as a research source. And so our goal is just to let people know that we're here, what we have, and have them use our material. Now, you don't have to be a film or television producer to gain access to the collection. Meet Mandela Logan and Brad Francini, residents of Los Angeles, whose unique interest in game shows brought them to our campus. You two have such similar backgrounds. Did you meet through the archive, or how did you meet? It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. When the internet first evolved, uh, before web pages were really big and everything, there was news groups where people posted you know, information and questions, and there was a group about game shows. Yeah. And Mandel and I both had a small videotape collection. I had about 10 tapes at the time. He had about, about 20. Two or yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> and we basically traded back and forth. And since then, we kept in touch. We both developed our own web pages. He has a web page devoted to classic Wheel of Fortune. Mm -hmm. I have a web page devoted to Pressure Luck. And since then, uh, we both wound up migrating to LA. 
And, and um, um, that's where we met <laughs> in we person met. for the first time. Are you two UCLA students? Um, no. No, we're not. Do you live near the campus? How did you find out about the archive? On the, on the news, the news group, somebody mentioned that somebody did some, I, I don't know, the student or somebody found out that UCLA had this, uh, what you could say, a treasure trove of all these shows which aren't on the air or which ha were thought to be long destroyed. Or, but apparently they've got some. And here. since we're in the area, it was a quick, uh, quick drive over here and they prepared the tapes for us. We went through their catalog and looked at stuff and said, you know, here's what we want. And they copied it over to tape because the tapes were on different formats. Some of them were on kinescope, some of them were on, you know, certain videotapes. And they copied them all for us. And we can just come here and watch them for free, which is great. How did you go about locating the tapes available? They have, they have, a, they have an online uh, catalog, which I was able to research on the World Wide Web. And you basically, I, t I typed in a search for, command for game shows or quiz shows. And they have over 1,300. And it was basically picking through the ones. They have a lot of stuff that you can see on TV. And we really wanted to find the ones that were the most rare. And they have a huge media room up there. They'll put the tapes in the VCR. And we're all going to sit in a conference room and basically control what we see. So. This is a media lab. If you're an archive client, you usually request those downstairs in Powell 46. And um, you would come up here and give us your ID. Usually the tapes are under your name. Um, and we would get them in the computer and then you tell us which one you want to see and we'll set you up in a carol so you can watch it. Tell us about the tapes you'll be watching today. They've got stuff here that you're not going to find on Game Show Network, yeah. you're not going to find in somebody's collection. It's basically stuff that is, yeah. for all intents and purposes, destroyed and it's being yeah. saved here. Or so never even aired because there's a lot of aired. pilots. So there's lots of pilots yeah. we're going we're gonna to probably see today that will never see the light of day because yeah. they were so bad. And that's kind of the fun of it all, seeing you know what people tried, to comparing it to what's going on in the air now with shows with people sitting in chairs and having electrodes put yeah. to them and seeing how that compares to what was going on in the yeah. 1970s. So. And learning so. what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> so would you recommend the art? archive to your friends. There's a TV museum here in LA and it doesn't even compare. I mean this place has got 10 times what they've got. Now if you'd like more information on how to gain access to the collection, log on to the World Wide Web at www.cinema.ucla.edu or you can email them at arsc at ucla.edu. For the cover story, I'm AJ Lewis. Where did AJ find all those game show maniacs? I don't know. It's nice that they can find each other on the net stage game shows in the garages and have friends. Scott, hmm. did you notice AJ? What about him? Well, uh, he looked great on camera, mm. and he delivers his lines well. He doesn't squirm around. Mm. Who squirms? Mm. Who squirms? Who squirms? Mm. Ever get the feeling that evil cyborgs have been sent to destroy your life? So did John Connor in Terminator 2. I'm Bob Rosen, Dean of the School of Theater, Film, and Television, and I'd like to welcome you to a second look at the movies. You know, those films in the past that stick in your mind and you can never forget, or maybe those that you wished you had seen in the past but never did, well, now it's an opportunity for that second look. And what better place to talk about the movies than around a dinner table? And what better dinner table than here in Westwood at Eurochow, right beside the UCLA campus in this absolutely spectacular architectural setting with a sumptuous meal that crosses all national boundaries coming up. And what better person to do it with than my dinner guest this <laughs> evening, Vivian Sobchak, professor at the School of Theater, Film, and Television and the Associate Dean. And the film we're going to take a look at this week is Terminator 2, Judgment Day. For the past 10 years since the film was made in 1991, Terminator 2 has achieved near cult status with sci-fi fanatics. It's the story of two technologically advanced cyborgs who return from the future to the present with a mission. One is to uh, protect a young boy on whom the future of the world depends. The other cyborg is out to kill him. Written and directed by James Cameron and starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, the film has many of the elements of classic sci-fi uh, mythic, mythic status. One is that line between the animate and the inanimate. Can these cyborgs, can these machines feel? Can they have sensibility? Do they have morals? And can they have loyalty? Another is the time shift element, where the 
the people coming from the future can change the course of historical events. And finally, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the boy and his powerhouse mother constitute a kind of ersatz family with a mission nothing less than saving the world. There's another issue as well. It deals with morphing, transformation. The Arnold Schwarzenegger cyborg is pretty impressive, really beyond human capabilities. But the other guy, the bad guy, is a newer model. And this model can metamorphose, can transform himself. He's made from molten metal. He can become other people. He can become inanimate objects. He can become the floor tiles. And it's that subject of metamorphosing, it seems to me, in its own right, would be a justification for that second look at uh, Terminator 2. And we're lucky in that Professor Sobchak has literally written a book on the subject. Her recent book, among many others about sci-fi, Metamorphine, Metamorphine, Visual Transformation and the Culture of Quick Change, published by University of Minnesota Press, deals mm -hmm. with the subject. Vivian, why should morphing be so important that it justifies a significant academic publication? Well, first of all, morphing has always been important. We just didn't call it metamorphing. Ovid, Ovid called it metamorphosis. And there's always been a fascination with being other than we can be. Um, what's unique, I think, um, or, or marked, I should say, for our culture at the moment that Terminator 2 came out was not only new cinematic technology, but our culture's fascination with change wrought by technology itself, and indeed on our bodies. Um, not just in terms of, you know, um, better washing machines and microwaves and the like. And so the fascination of a new cinematic technology coupled with the notion of um, uh, the incredible effortlessness uh, of, of quick change. I mean, it's interesting that the uh, cyborg is, in fact, a metal morph. It's like quicksilver, quite mm -hmm. literally. Throughout the history of film, there have been other images of transformation mm -hmm. like that. I think about the many versions of Jekyll and Hyde and the werewolf and, and even the nutty professor, there's a scene there of that kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. How is this different? I think this is different because if you take, for example, two classic horror films, um, uh, although Frankenstein sits between science fiction and horror, uh, in, Frank in, in, in um, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it was all dependent on lighting and, mm. and uh, on um, the actor acting and shifts of angle and so forth. Um, not technology, although it was using technology, mm. obviously. Um, in something like The Wolfman, they went to great lengths to have Lon Chaney Jr. transform into right. a wolf. They used yak hair. Yeah. And they <laughs> stopped the cameras in between every shot and had to more hair applied and so forth. So they were using what the, was then the latest special effects technology. But we're dealing with the transformation of human into beast. Okay? Mm -hmm. Kind of return to beast, the, the primal um, urges within. Now, um, the transformation seems to move in the other direction of the human into the machine and 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 very thin line um, separating the animate uh, and um, the kind of animation of the technological. So it's really okay. important now. Well, I got to say, for the morphing scenes alone, it's worth the price of admission. Absolutely. And you've given us many reasons for taking a second look at Terminator 2. Thank you. And now it's, I think we ought to have dinner. Okay, but I would say people should look at Terminator 2 and also rent The Wolfman and the Frederick March, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, if they want to see different kinds of transformation. A good idea. A look into the past. Thanks. Thank you. You know they're making T3? Hmm. Of course. Ooh. That uh, liquid metal Terminator guy thing didn't die at the second one. All right, didn't Arnold melt him in a vat of molten steel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can't kill a liquid Terminator guy by melting him in liquid. But he was all mixed in. Exactly. You see, uh. they're going to make some very mean liquid toaster out of that stuff. Oh, mean toasters. Mm. That's your idea of a sequel. Oh. I bet you that liquid Terminator didn't die. You want to uh, bet a date on it? Okay, it's a date. A date. Did you hear oh, yeah. that? I have a date with this lady. Can I have some tape of this? Terminator 3 is at least um, two huh? years away. Mm -hmm. Okay, Scott, it's mm. a date unless I'm busy that well, night. Weren't you going to come over to my house and help me clean out my closets? Oh, yeah, and right around. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> busy. Evil cyborg sent to destroy your life.
Valerie, Alex, where are you guys at? Can I come? We are at Kirkall Grand Salon and Swing Night. Yeah, and no, Scott, you can't come. This happened last Saturday. Tonight, we're going to be interviewing James Zimmer, the founder of the UCLA Ballroom Dance Club. And we're going to be taking some lessons, so... And I'm going to learn how to express myself through Let's dance. Move. Let's move and walk over. Mosey and Riverdance. James Zimmer, the founder of the UCLA Ballroom Club, super duper extravaganza, swinging, salsa, you name it, he does it. Here he is, James. How you doing? Thanks for coming. You're welcome. I mean, thanks for being here. Glad you guys can be here for our swing night. It's going to be a lot of fun tonight. We do uh, Saturday night dances about three times a year. And our Monday nights is our main event. We give four hours of dance lessons, Monday nights from 7 to 11 in Ackerman's second floor lounge. Tonight is swing night. Okay, you want to give us a little history of swing dancing? Or? If you know it, I mean, I don't know it. I mean, if you know, I mean, I, I watched that movie, Swingers. That's about as, my, as far as my history goes, and then, then it's a void. Well, as they say, it's all on the internet. Great. Now, some people say that love is the international language. I beg to differ. I beg to disagree. I think that dance is the international language of language or something. What do you think about that? Well, we have a slogan here our, our, with our, our club, and that's where great romances begin. Uh. What I love about this program is it brings together students, staff, faculty, alumni, and all the different ethnic and cultural groups on campus to come together to meet, to celebrate learning about the many different cultures of the world. And so, yes, people come. Most people speak English if they're here, of course. Yeah, but uh, you don't have to say a word when you're dancing. It's a, it's, it's a non-verbal communication between a man and a woman, or or same sex, which we, we welcome everyone. I hear you have a, a co co-director, co-director yes. here, co-teacher, co-director. Can we bring Helps her make over it all and... happen. Yeah, her name is I'm Cynthia Alex. Harper. Rep, yeah. Cynthia, good to meet you. I'm Valerie. Valerie, how are you doing? You know this guy, right? Oh yes. Yeah. She had a recently her. her photograph in the newspaper performing historical dances. She does all kinds of performances throughout California of 19th century dances. See, you can tell I'm really rigid, so hopefully you can teach me something. Well, some. loosen you up. We got yeah, WD-40 from yeah, the I'm like the scarecrow. There's Tin Man. <laughs> Valerie, though. No, she's, look at, you can tell she's just already, she's walking spice. <laughs> For joining us tonight. It's really exciting. We're looking forward to seeing you in show and uh, see you guys on the dance floor. Thank you, Thank James. You. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> We're going to be dancing up a storm in a second. Thank Check you. it out. <laughs> Cut on that hook. Huh. Not this one, the first one. Wait, this is a good one. Huh.
that was really kind of sweet. There were all a lot of guys there alone just trying to learn to dance. That's right, ladies. Monday nights, you'll find guys who are at least making an effort. And some of us can make more than an effort. You can dance? Sure. Oh, yeah. Watch this. Uh-uh! Uh-uh! Uh, 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 uh. I don't understand. I don't, okay, I don't understand the vocals. All right, go you. Go. Go. Next week, we will meet Jack Larson, Jimmy Olsen from the Superman TV show. He was a film producer later in life, and he'll join Bob Rosen for a second look at China Syndrome. So come back next week for UCLA Next. Thank you.